All right, first thing I, w- I want you to do is um, imagine that you're in my shoes. Probably about eight years ago, I'm in bed asleep. I really like to sleep. Middle of the night, probably about 3 a.m. And you know, you get that little feeling that, that something's moving on your bed. And uh, suddenly my, my daughter is beside me, um, shaking a little bit. She's had a nightmare. That's not the first one. It's been happening for the last couple of weeks. Um, there's some sort of monster going to eat her up in her bedroom, and I have to, you know, save the day. I've got two options there. Number one, I could get out of bed. It's really cold. I could go across the room. I could turn the light. I could check under the bed. I could check the cupboards. I could reassure her. Or number two, I could introduce the Dream Slayer protocols, which everyone knows about. No? So it was kind of a cheat. Um, so basically what I did is um, I decided... Let's face this nightmare. Let's, let's sit up Eliza. Eliza's over there. Uh, so we sat up in bed and we worked out, we actually faced that nightmare. What is this monster? What does it look like? How many eyes has it got? What's it smell like? And tried to visualize this monster that's been terrorizing it. And then slowly we started to change that monster and change, um, I guess, the power dynamic there that, that Eliza could actually start to think away that monster. Didn't take, but it, it took a while. I'm going to get you to actually um, practice this now. So could I get everyone to close their eyes? And um, I want you to think about a puppy. So I don't want it moving or anything, but just uh, sitting down. um, Its tongue can come out if you want. Um, But just think about a puppy. And it's just sitting there. Now I want you to actually control that puppy and make it jump up. It can jump around. It can can jump up on you if you want. And, um, yeah, open your eyes. Now have a big thought. Um, What you've done there is you've taken control of your images and you've shown yourself that you can actually think change in your own mind. So what we did with Eliza is um, gave her the power to actually change that nightmare. And I'm not saying it's super simple and it would happen in one night. It didn't. It took training. But she was able to develop a magical sword that could basically destroy that monster with just a single touch. It's pretty destructive. And now I look back, I probably should have been a bit more pacifist about it. Um, But that, that actually worked for her. So it shows that there is, there is power in imagination, that we can actually think things to change, but that it does require uh, training. And that's where you are today. <laughs> oh, too far. Right, that's good. OK, so we're at the Hero Roundtable, and it's about people's powerful stories, um, but it's also about what you can actually take away from this. I'm a high school teacher. And um, I am also a house leader, which means that I'm in charge of the well-being of about 250 kids from age 12 to 19. Um, So I see a lot of different things coming and going. Um, Same sort of problems come up, but then there's some strange ones as well. Um, But one thing I have been noticing lately is a sense of disconnection. Uh, So for whatever reason, students are not connecting as well, uh, particularly at the year seven level. So what I decided to do about that is to tap into this idea that imagination and and, um, group imagining of things can actually help bring people together and um, build some things. So as you can see with the title there, I'm using narrative role-playing games to actually train heroes or get people prepared to actually make some good choices um, or some powerful choices. If we just said for all the kids in here, actually, primary school kids here, all right, tomorrow I want you to go out and be a hero. they won't, they won't know what to do. So we need to actually uh, give them training, put them in situations where they can actually practice succeeding and failing. Um, so when the time does come, they can hopefully have some, some idea of what does work and what doesn't work. Um, so I, uh, I basically use role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons. There's, there's basically a game for any, any kind of um, interest group. So Star Wars, uh, regular sort of people in a regular sort of high school. But the idea is that in role-playing games, you make a character and you play that character in different situations. So if I'm sitting down to play, I'm not Ben Langdon. I might be, um, uh, let's call me Gwenda the female dwarf or something like that, something totally different. There's three three things that I focus on in the high school situation. Um, Obviously, education, that's why the kids are there. So games can actually... um, teach explicit content from different curriculum areas like science, geography, definitely maths, but that's not what we're talking about today. Engagement uh, is a really, really important one, and that's probably the one that that forced me into this situation in the first place. 
We get a lot of um, students coming from different primary schools. I, I work in Geelong, and uh, we get students from Lara all the way down to the coast. And a lot of those kids come with not knowing anyone else at that school. So they're suddenly in a school of about 1,000 people, and they don't know anyone. So they're the kids that you see at lunchtimes, maybe sitting by themselves or just walking as if they're really uh, into something really important, but they can't tell you what it is. Um, there's, there's, I'm seeing that more and more often. Um, also, there's, there's a lot more anxiety in, in young people today, um, whether that is, like Simon said yesterday, that, um, that parents are probably responding to that in a not very helpful way, uh, maybe not helping build resilience earlier on. But there, are, there is a lot of different types of anxiety. Um, also, autism, um, that presents in a lot of different ways as well, and that can sometimes lead to disengagement. And also, at my school, there's a lot of trauma backgrounds, so kids growing up in domestic violence or uh, a single violent act, and it's, it's affecting the way they're actually connecting with the school and also their peers. The key one that I'm looking at today is, um, it's kind of like my philosophy, I think. Empathy is probably the most important thing that I think we can do as humans. Um, I'm also an author, and the reason I've written my books is because I think that if people can put themselves in other people's shoes, they are more likely to assist when needed and also understand that their own self-centred world isn't necessarily the one that, that actually exists. And a lot of other speakers have mentioned that today. Okay, so empathy and role-playing games. They actually work really well together. There's been lots of studies about this as well. But generally what you're doing is you're putting yourself into um, another person's shoes by creating a character, like I said before. Um, so, for example, in a game where you're playing teenage detectives trying to solve problems like Veronica Mars or Nancy Drew or something like that, you're actually pretending to be someone else and you're solving a problem. There's two types of empathy that we, we can look at. There's cognitive empathy, which is using a lot of your brain. It's, it's a deliberate choice to step inside someone else, else's shoes, um, someone that is different from yourself. So, for the, um, the boys in my groups, they might create a female character, okay? They might create a, a female character of the same age, and they're actually playing from a totally different perspective that they may not have thought about before. You could also look at age as a difference as well. So a young person could play an old person. The next one is emotional empathy. And um, the conference today and yesterday is pretty much about that. We're hearing stories up here of, of um, amazing people going through some pretty traumatic things and some pretty inspiring things as well. And although the people in the audience here can't actually step in their shoes, we're feeling an emotional connection and we're following along and we can feel, we can feel that um, we would be there for that person if they needed help. And that's, that's emotional empathy. So when I go about um, doing this, um, one of the, the ways that I actually try to encourage empathy is when they come against a conflict, um, I've got three steps for them to actually go through when they, when they do that. So for example, um, we'll go with Eliza in the nightmare situation. Um, we look at what's actually happening in that nightmare or in that situation. What's happening? What are some of the consequences that could happen after that? And what alternatives are there to that? So we ask a few questions. First one is actually look at what's going on and then take another step and work out why is this happening. So the monster's in the cupboard. It's going to eat her face. Um, has it been living there for 200 years or something? Like are we actually in its space? Um, is it hungry? Is it scared? Is it alone? Think about um, reasons that it might be acting the way it is. The next one is consequences. What's going to happen next? So you see a situation, you use your brain to actually work out, okay, if I don't do anything, what's going to happen? In the case of Eliza, she was going to get eaten, um, and she'd wake up and she'd be terrified. Um, the next one, though, is we, you sort of stop and you work out, okay, how can I make a difference? And hopefully, most people will be looking at how to make a positive difference there. So in the case of um, the magical sword there, uh, we basically destroyed the monster. It's probably not so good anymore. Um, but in, in an, if we did it again, we could look at um, what would happen if you actually presented that monster in your dream with a really nice meal, or if you started to talk to it in its own language, um, or if you um, put on some music and, and, and tried to calm it down. There's, there's different ways that we can actually de-escalate the situation. Obviously, fantasy worlds are not the same as our real world. So with the games that we play in the, the high school situation, we also have to make links with the real world. So the same questions can happen in a real world situation. 
uh, might be walking, as a student, I might be working th walking through the yard and two girls are yelling at each other, calling each other horrible names. You stop and you look at what's actually happening. Uh, do you know those girls? Do you know they've got a problem with each other? Do you know that something happened at recess that's now affecting it? Um, are there other people around? Is there a crowd coming closer and closer together? And think about why that might be happening. The next bit is, if you don't do anything, what's going to happen? Can you see that they're going to get um, possibly even pushed against their will into a fight? Can you see in the distance that there's a teacher coming and you know, they may save the day? Um, what's going to happen? As a bystander, though, the next one's really important. You've got some alternatives. What can you do? Unfortunately, I think a lot of the times people pick up their phone and they can film what's going to happen. Okay, there's going to be a fight. I could film this. I could get heaps of hits on social media. Or I could pretend to take an important call and just sort of walk away because it's none of my business. It's really important for us to go through those different situations and work out what's the consequence of each of those. Um, Another great thing about role-playing games is that it's a very safe, supportive environment where it's not the, the consequences aren't real. So if you uh, do something terrible in the game, it's not going to affect your real life. Um, as Karen said yesterday, um, it's okay to fail, and you learn a lot from failing. And in role-playing games, a lot of the outcomes are based on choices backed up by random rolling of dice. So you can end up with um, complete schmozzles happening, even with the best laid plans. So you might end up, for example, um, hanging over the pot of a, uh, sorry, hanging over a cooking pot and about to be eaten or something like that. The, the, the benefits, though, of doing that in a safe, secure environment is that it's okay to realize that, okay, I messed up there, but the rest of me is okay. And you can actually, in a secure environment, is sort of laugh at your failures, like, wow, I stuffed that one up really big. Um, and even maybe a couple of days later, you're still talking about the stuff up, but it's not actually weighing down on your head. You're not thinking that every, all of your peers are actually looking down at you for that failure. Um, things go right as well. So role-playing games are really good at building relationships, and that's one of the key reasons I, I brought it into the high school. Um, it includes, uh, sorry, it, it really um, reinforces negotiation skills, Compromise, which is really important for teenagers, I think. Um, you can't get everything all the time. Sometimes you have to delay your gratification. I'm going to move on quickly. All right, what can you do now? So I'm up here to say that um, everyone here can actually help build someone else's imagination and their empathy and their engagement, not necessarily by doing role-playing games, but you can look at it in a more simplistic way of looking at imaginative play. So like I did with my daughter when she was having a nightmare, you can go through some made-up situations. So what I'd like people to do today is uh, maybe on the way home tonight, if you've got kids, maybe just throw them a line like, hey guys, what's going to happen? Like, what would happen if aliens just landed in the middle of Yarram right now? And, and think through things like that that are, that are fantastical, uh, but we can actually start to use our imagination to look at alternatives rather than think that there's a single, uh, single pathway. Thanks very much. Thank <music> you.